All right, here we are, uh, third lecture of this series. Um, disclosure, it's a little bit late uh, for me, uh, so I'm going to try to do this. Hopefully it makes sense. Hopefully there aren't too many typos. Um, I apologize in advance if there are, um, and I do end up posting it. Uh, anyways, uh, so here we go. Um, so I'm going to try to go quickly because I noticed my other videos were really, really long, um, which has its pros and its cons because it's nice and thorough explanation, but then it goes on for forever and I realize that that's not always the best thing. Um, so let's jump right in. So right now we're um, in section 2.3, um, and so that is all about um, bonds and what happens when we have atoms coming together and forming bonds, different types of bonds. Um, and the shapes that they have um, and how that affects their function. So we're going to talk about um, four different types of attractions um, or bonds that form between atoms and between molecules um, and different species. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about are covalent bonds, we're going to talk about ionic bonds, we're going to talk about hydrogen, oh, that's not the right number. <laughs> Let's just try redoing that. We're going to talk about hydrogen bonding, and then our last, we're going to talk about van der Waals um, interactions or van der Waal bonding, or uh, actually no, not bond bonding. What is it called? Forces. Yeah, forces. Sometimes it's called. Um, so uh, when we talk about bonds, um, everyone's like, oh, you know, James Bond. Um, that joke is usually lost on actually your generation now. Um, but the point here is um, bonds, when we talk about bonds, are like attractions or like connections that form between atoms um, or in some cases between molecules um, or other types of chemical species. So here we have a molecule of CH4, also known as methane. And we have a carbon atom, and it has a bond represented as a line um, between four separate hydrogen atoms. Okay, um, so the first type of bond we're going to talk about, like I said, is um, covalent bonds. Um, and covalent bonds are the strongest type of bonds that we're going to talk about, and they involve electrons being shared. You guys already learned about ionic bonds, and you're probably going to learn about covalent bonds. Um, but uh, what you really need to know is that they're sharing electrons. Um, so if you remember ionic bonds, electrons were transferred. In this case, the electrons are actually coming one, um, from each of the atoms within your compound, and they are coming together and being shared between the two or however many um, atoms are coming together. So for example, we have a hydrogen atom here, and it's represented as a cloud, but you know that we can also do it as a ring, right? And if you look at your periodic table, you know that hydrogen has one electron, right? And I'm gonna do this in different color because that seems like a really good idea. And then we have our other hydrogen atom here, right? Again, one electron, right? And so those electrons can kind of move, right? Because electrons are very um, mobile. And eventually, that's an arrow, really ugly looking arrow. What you get is that those electrons can be shared between our two atoms and they form a bond that doesn't look anything like what I'm drawing right now. But sometimes I draw it like that, something like that. <laughs> but the point here is that um, these electrons are shared, okay? They're shared between the atoms. Um, and it turns out that um, sometimes those electrons are shared in a pretty equal way and like everyone has like a, you know, about equal distance um, from those electrons, but sometimes they're not shared in equal way at all. Um, and I always think about like toddlers or like animals in this case. Um, but before I get into that part, I guess, uh, what I should say is there are special words for this like different type of sharing. Um, so if um, the atoms are arranged in a way that um, they all kind of equally pull on those electrons, they all kind of attract them in an equal way, we refer to that as, an, as a bond that is non-polar, right? And this is a new word for you guys, um, but just think about um, the word pole, right? When you have a pole somewhere, you have like the North Pole and you have the South Pole, right? Those are two totally different things. Um, so this is saying that there are no poles, that it's kind of all equal around. So if you had your methane molecule like we had before, 
Um, we have carbon and it has those four hydrogens around it. And when we talk about shape, you'll learn that those hydrogens are kind of spread out in an equal distance around the carbon and away from each other. And they're all kind of, um, the carbon is uh, sharing those electrons kind of equally with each of those hydrogen atoms. Um, and so we call that nonpolar because the electrons are kind of evenly distributed and they're not being pulled to one side or the other. And that's why I have this picture of these two uh, guinea pigs and they are kind of equally sharing that those electron pairs that are represented as a carrot here, right? So this is our non-polar covalent bond. And so maybe this will make more sense in comparison to a polar covalent bond. And that happens when for um, a variety of reasons, but primarily because of electronegativity, um, one of the atoms or one part, one side of the uh, molecule is pulling the electrons away from the other side. So there's kind of an uneven distribution, an unequal sharing of electrons. And we call that polar because it makes a pole. It makes like a slightly positively charged pole and a slightly negatively charged pole because wherever the electrons are being pulled, it's going to be more negative because we know that electrons have a negative charge. Um, and remember this word electronegativity, we didn't talk about it in any of these lectures yet, but you should remember it from your chemistry class, that electronegativity is this desire or this ability to attract electrons to it. So if, a, if you have an atom that is highly electronegative or has a higher electronegativity, that atom will draw electrons to it. Okay, And so again, we can make a kind of um, comparison with humans, which is kind of fun to do when it comes to um, uh, chemistry, but you might imagine these two toddlers as two atoms here, um, and this toddler in the red is kind of not really getting a fair shot at holding onto that, that ball or whatever they have, right? So you can imagine that this is kind of like pulling the electrons, the, the toddler in the green shirt is pulling the electrons towards it, it's pulling the ball towards it. So it's not, it's a not equally sharing that um, ball, which is our comparison to our electrons, right? Um, maybe that was confusing, made a lot of sense in my head. But um, let me give you uh, an actual example, not just uh, toddlers, right? So I talked about it before. Here is a molecule of methane. Um, this, uh, the white uh, blobby things are hydrogen atoms, right? Just like we have here. And then the, the, the black mm, blobby thing that's kind of supposed to be um, circular is our carbon atom, right? So again, we have carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This should be kind of drawn better, right? And so they are equally distributed around the carbon. There are those eight electrons all around the carbon and they are distributed equally, right? And also, I just want to point out while we're still here and I'm doing stuff with colors, um, this hydrogen here brought one of these electrons, this hydrogen here brought one of these electrons, this hydrogen here brought this one electron that I drew over there, but I really should have drawn in a better position. Oh, fudgy wudgy. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and so this hydrogen atom, like I said, brought this electron, this hydrogen atom brought this electron, right? Um, because hydrogen has one valence electron. And you'll remember that carbon has four valence electrons. And I, again, didn't do a fabulous job of drawing it. But here is one of carbon's valence electrons. Here's another one of carbon's valence electrons. Here's another one. And here's another one, right? Um, and I just want to point out uh, that um, they try these these molecules often form in ways or these bonds form in ways so that there are eight electrons around a particular atom or in the case of hydrogen two electrons it can be satisfied with just two because it only needs to fill two to have a full valence shell um, and so these the the covalent bonds um, as well as ionic bonds will form to kind of satisfy that desire. Um, but anyway, so this carbon is sharing these electrons, it's sharing these electrons, it's sharing these, it's sharing these, and the hydrogen is also sharing, right? Um, so back to what I was saying before, um, we have 
a nonpolar molecule here because the electrons are being shared equally. And an example, a classic example of a polar compound is water, right? So we have H2O, um, and the hydrogen, again, brought one electron into the game here, um, and we have our oxygen that had how many valence electrons? Yeah, six, correct. Um, so, uh, shoot, I shouldn't use a red color because that's not going to show up very well. We're going to use green. So we have one, it had this other one, um, it has another one that it brought, um, actually I should have drawn this one in a slightly different place. So, uh, so oxygen has two of its electrons that are being shared with the hydrogen electrons, and then it also has um, two electrons that are already paired up, and they're not bonded with anything actually, and we haven't talked about that, and I don't think we really need to talk about that in this class, um, but we can talk about it outside of this class if you want to. Um, but the point here is that oxygen is more electronegative. I'm just going to write electroneg. That's for electronegative. And it pulls the electrons away uh, from the hydrogen atoms, which are less electronegative. Um, and it's not pulling them away in a huge way. It's not like taking them away from the hydrogen, but the electrons are kind of, they're more distributed towards the oxygen side of the molecule, and since electrons have a negative charge, we see this negative charge kind of overall on one side of the molecule compared to the other. The other side becomes slightly positive because it doesn't have as many electrons around. Um, and we use this symbol here, which is like, it's kind of like a swirly thing. Um, it's, a, it's a D uh, in Greek, I believe, like a lowercase d, um, and it means slightly negative. Um, and this means slightly positive, um, and they're kind of fun to draw. Uh, anyways, uh, so that's polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay, moving on to next thing. Uh, so that's all you need to know about covalent bonds. Now let's talk about ionic bonds, which I'm going to go through really quickly because you already did this in, in chemistry class, and this should be like super, super review. Um, so when we talk about covalent bonds, um, we are talking about covalent ionic Ionic bonds, oh my god. Ionic bonds um, involve electrons being transferred, right? Um, so the electrons are not being shared, they are being transferred from one atom to another atom. And when that happens, that means that there's an imbalance of electrons, right? Because when we have an atom, we have um, the same number of positive charge as we do negative charge, and overall then it's neutral. But if an atom gains or if it loses electrons, then suddenly that disrupts that balance that we had, and we call these new entities that form ions. And ion just means a charged particle, so something that has an overall charge. And if it has an overall positive charge, we call it a cation, and you can remember that because of the T, cat ion, that's our positive charge, and anions are the negative charges, right? So if you have a Na, a sodium ion with a positive charge, um, it is a cation. If you have a fluorine um, with a negative charge, which we call a fluoride ion, it is an anion. Okay? Don't confuse those. Don't be scared of those words. They're really fun to use. And that arrow is pointing at the sodium ion. <laughs> um, and so it turns out, as you know from um, probably other sciences classes, that positive and negatives attract each other, right? And so when we see these positive charged ions and these negative charged ions cut um, forming, we see them coming together and forming an attraction between each other, and that attraction is what is the ionic bond. Um, and actually, when we talk about ionic compounds, we don't really call them molecules, because molecules means that they have a covalent bond. Um, we actually call them salts, a lot of the times, or we just say ionic compounds. Okay, um, so a salt is something that is an ionic compound. We have a positive, we have a cation, or some number of cations, um, and we have anions, one or more, um, forming an overall uh, compound that has a neutral charge. And I realize that my notes on this page are all over the place. Like I said, it's past my bedtime. Anyways, um, so I'm going to give you the classic example that I've given you before of sodium chloride. So sodium um, has... A total of 11 electrons and it has one valence electron, right? And chlorine has a total of 
uh, 17 electrons, um, but it has seven valence electrons here, right? And remember the octet rule where uh, ions will form so that, or will form more likely if they can um, have eight valence electrons, um, or in some cases two, because that is what satisfies um, having a full valence shell, right? They're trying to be like uh, the noble gases. Uh, and so chlorine is just one electron away from having that octet, right? And sodium, if it gets rid of that one extra electron it has, it has a full shell underneath and that's like, it's a pretty good deal for it. Um, so what we see happening is that the electrons are transferred, the sodium transfers its electron to the chlorine, it becomes a positively charged ion, a cation, a sodium ion, chlorine gains an electron, it becomes an anion, it becomes a chloride ion, and suddenly we have these positive, these negatives, and when they're near each other like that, they have this wonderful bond that we call the ionic bond. Um, and we call this compound together sodium chloride. Um, you'll notice that the ending of the anion oftentimes has an ending of ide, um, and that's this, this nomenclature that we have for ionic compounds. And then, um, in the case of sodium chloride and a lot of other salts, it will form these kinds of very regularly arranged crystals, right? So salts oftentimes are crystals. And that's ionic compounds. Um, you do need to realize, and you might already remember this, that it's not always one cation and one anion. In some cases, you'll have um, a cation coming together with maybe two anions, right? And the reason for that is because they are trying to balance out their overall charge um, to be zero, right? So if we have a magnesium ion that forms a plus two uh, charged ion, um, it can form a compound with chloride, but it would need two chlorides, each of which have that negative um, charge to balance out its overall charge to make it zero, and that's why we see magnesium chloride, MgCl2, that two means that there are two chloride ions in the compound. Hopefully that made sense. I know that you guys have been learning that already, and you don't need to know it in a lot of detail. You need to know that there are cations and there are anions, and it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio. So, um, that is ions and ionic compounds. Um, moving along, no, um, we're going to talk about hydrogen bonding, right? Um, and so hydrogen bonding is really important. Um, the hydrogen bonds are weaker bonds that form um, compared to uh, ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Covalent bonds are stronger than ionic bonds, um, and hydrogen bonds are weaker than ionic bonds. Right, so covalent, strongest, then ionic, then hydrogen um, bonds. And hydrogen bonds are attractions that form between a hydrogen atom, surprise, surprise, and an electronegative atom, right? So that's oftentimes fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, right? Those are the common ones. So if you see an attraction between a fluorine and a hydrogen somewhere, or an oxygen and a hydrogen somewhere, or a nitrogen and a hi hydrogen somewhere, um, that is a bond. And the thing to note there is that it's between um, different molecules, right? So when we look at water, for example, this bond that's between this oxygen and the hydrogen within a molecule is not a hydrogen bond. That is a covalent bond. But if you have one water molecule and you have another water molecule, um, right, separate molecules, the oxygen of one molecule will be attracted to the hydrogen of another molecule, right? And it forms this, this attraction that we call a hydrogen bond. And it's actually really important um, for water and the way that water behaves in the world as we know it. Um, a lot of the properties that we see of water, um, like for example, like the droplets that form or the fact that it like sticks to surfaces or that it needs a lot of energy to heat up or that it like keeps the same temperature for a long time, all of that is related to the fact that there is hydrogen in it um, and these hydrogen bonds form between the water molecules. Uh, another example of a hydrogen bond is between, for example, water and ammonia, 
right? And so again, we have our hydrogen, right? We said it's always between a hydrogen and some electronegative um, atom. And so in this case, it's between a hydrogen and a nitrogen, right? And they are separate molecules, right? We have an ammonia molecule, we have a water molecule, and the hydrogen of the water molecule is forming this attraction between uh, or to the, the nitrogen atom, right? Um, and usually uh, what you should note there is that the electronegative atom has a slightly negative charge, right? Um, because it's drawing electrons and our um, hydrogen has a slightly positive and so that is positive charge and that is where our attraction is forming. Okay, um, and so those are hydrogen bonds, um, kind of the, sh the short story, I guess. Uh, and so, wait, no, I want to do this. Um, moving on to our next type of bond, our attraction, really. Um, it's, it's a very weak attraction, but an important one, but it's compared to the others relatively weak. We call them van der Waals in, uh, interactions, um, and named after some dude, right, as always, and they are weak attractions that form again between molecules when they are close together. And what's important to note about them is um, that similar to the hydrogen bond where you have something that's slightly um, positive, or slightly, yeah, slightly positive and slightly negative, um, forming that kind of like attraction. A lot of times what happens with van der Waals interactions is that you have Let's say you have um, an atom, and because of how the electrons kind of shift in their distribution, it forms these dipoles, um, or these positively or negatively charged um, sides. And because it has positively or negatively charged sides, uh, when they get close to each other, if there's a positive side and then there's a negative side, then they will kind of form this like little attraction to each other. Um, and your textbook talks about how that happens on a gecko's feet. Um, I don't really know a lot about that, but cool. That's why geckos can stick to walls and ceilings and things like that. Um, but the, the important thing to know is that these are weak interactions between molecules. Um, and they're not specifically just hydrogen atoms that are involved. So that's attractions. Um, and so I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about shape of uh, molecules. Um, and shape is really important for function in biology, and we'll go over that over and over and over again. When we talk about proteins, it's all about the shape. Um, and there are very specific mechanisms to make sure that um, we have the correct shape of all the proteins, and if that changes, then it's bad news. All that kind of stuff. But right now, what you need to know from this section is if you remember how we talked about electron orbitals, um, what I want you to take away from this is when a covalent bond forms, right? Um, before we talked about how we have like S orbitals, which are these kind of those circular orbitals, and then we had those kind of like loopy guys that were the, the P orbitals, right? Um, and we only really talked about those two, um, although there are others. And what you need to know is that those S and P orbitals kind of disappear uh, when we have a covalent bond. They hybridize, um, which means that they change shape, right? A hybrid is some kind of new entity, this new creature, right? So when they hybridize, they change their shape from being that nice like spherical S orbital and the loop-D I don't know what the word is for those things. I'm just going to call them like loopy things, but that doesn't seem like it makes any sense. Anyway, so the, the spherical S orbitals and our looping uh, or figure eight P orbitals, they kind of change their shape into um, what looks a lot like the P orbitals, um, but they're not six of them. Um, there are four of these hybrid orbitals that form. And you don't need to really know much more than just that. There are four of those. Um, uh, but you should be familiar with this, this name for the shape, uh, which is a tetrahedron. Um, tetra means four. So tetrahedron is a four-sided um, shape that you have here, right? So that's our four hybrid orbitals, okay? Um, and Examples of molecules that form that tetra, 
polyhedron shape are methane, right? Um, which we talked about before, which is CH4. Um, so in methane, they form, carbon forms uh, covalent bonds uh, with the hydrogens, and instead of having the spherical S orbital and then the loop D P orbitals, instead it makes this these funny um, four uh, tetrahedron hybrid orbitals and that has to do with the fact that um, electrons don't like to be around other electrons um, and so when and uh, when a molecule comes together uh, and its electrons are involved in these bonds they will they will move themselves around so that they are as far away as they possibly can be um, from another pair of electrons um, and that's just the nature of electrons. And you might realize that that has to do with the fact they all have the same charge, right? The same charge repels each other. And so they form this shape um, that maximizes their distance from one another, right? That's as far away as they could possibly be from one another. Um, and it turns out that actually water molecules, even though they don't have four hydrogens, they only have two hydrogens, they do that too. But what they do is that they have these, um, so they have the two hydrogen molecules, right? And you've seen that before, that it's an O and then there's an H and an H and they're kind of at an angle from each other. Um, but like I told you before, oxygen also has these two electron pairs that are not in a bond um, because when they're already paired up, they don't want to make new bonds. But these pairs, you know, they exist and they're important um, and they don't want to be near the pairs of the, 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 the bonding hydrogens. And so they will arrange themselves so they're also in a tetrahedron shape, um, or almost in a tetrahedron shape. There's a slight, um, almost, yeah. And, uh, and that has to do with the fact that they just want to be as far apart as possible, right? Um, and so this shape that the water molecule has is actually really important because it's because of this shape that we see that water is polar, right? It's because we have an oxygen molecule and two hydrogens that are kind of at an angle on one side, um, that makes that side the slightly positive side, right? If we had oxygen and hydrogen and hydrogen and they were in a line, um, then we wouldn't see the same kind of poles uh, forming, the same kind of positive poles, uh, because they would be pulling the electrons um, kind of equally and they would cancel each other out. Um, so if we had a linear water molecule, it wouldn't end up being polar in the same way that our our, our actual water molecule is, um, and that has to do with its shape. Okay, so just what you need to take away from that, if none of what I just said made sense, which I hope it did, um, is that the shape is really important for the function of a molecule. Um, the, the way that the, the uh, atoms are arranged has a huge, and the electrons as well, has a huge impact on what that particular molecule will do. And we've been looking at these kind of simple molecules, but we can look at more complex molecules, and you'll see that in a much um, more clear way. So in your book, it gives an example of an endorphin molecule, which is a molecule that you have in your body, um, and we all do, and it's a great molecule that makes you feel good about all kinds of things. Um, and it has a particular kind of shape, right? Um, and if you look at... Uh, the, this diagram that you have here, right? Carbon is um, the, the, these black sections, the hydrogens are these white sections, we have some oxygens, we have some nitrogens, we have a sulfur here and there, right? So this whole thing is our endorphin molecule, and in order for it to do what it does in your body, it needs to be able to bond to a receptor. And we'll get more into that later, but the point is that receptor has a special shape. You might imagine it like, you know, when you have a key, right? It fits into your lock, and that particular key only works on the right lock. Um, sometimes you wouldn't even be able to fit it into a different lock. Sometimes you can fit it into a different lock, but it's not going to do anything, right? Um, so these molecules have a specific shape, right, that they need to have in order to fit onto the parts of your body or parts of an animal or organism's body that they need to work on, and if they don't have that shape, then it won't work. Um, and in 
pharmaceuticals, we can take advantage of that because we can make molecules that have very similar shape, similar or the same shape, um, and then we can control things that are going on the bottom body. Um, so morphine is a drug that can be used um, that acts in ways that are very similar to endorphin, um, and it uh, it has to do with the fact that it has the same shape. Okay, so I think that kind of covers it. Um, shape and function, that is a point. And we'll talk more about that later. So let's do some practice questions. Uh, again, I recommend that you pause the video, take a moment to answer them, and then check your answers against mine. Um, so the question is, what holds the atoms together in a crystal of magnesium chloride? And I gave you a hint there that it's a salt. So take a moment to answer that. Um, hopefully you took a moment to answer that. Hopefully you remembered magnesium and chloride makes MgCl2. And you know that since I said it's a salt, then it must be an ionic compound. So I, what holds um, the ions together in an ionic compound are ionic, that's an N, ionic bonds, right? Uh, so the answer there is ionic bonds hold the atoms together in an ionic compound, right? So we have a magnesium uh, ion and we have a chloride and we have a chloride. Yay! And we have our magnesium chloride. Next, what kinds of attractions form between water molecules? So, take a moment to pause the video and answer that. Hopefully, you paused the video and answered it. So we have a hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. Here's one water molecule, right? Um, and then if I have another water molecule right here, I'm not doing a great job of drawing these, but you get the picture, right? So we will remember that we form hydrogen bonds between hydrogen and another electronegative atom, which happens to be oxygen in this case, right? And so we see these attractions forming between the oxygens and the hydrogens of separate water molecules, right? They have this slight attraction because the hydrogens are slightly positive, the oxygens are slightly negative, right? Because of the polar nature, oops, that's wrong. Because of the polar uh, nature of our water molecule. Dink. So the answer there is hydrogen bonds. All right, um, we have our last question, and it's a multiple choice question, and I really hope there's no typos like in that last one. But here goes. Um, so if we have, um, if we're looking at, if we're comparing ionic compounds and covalent compounds or bonds, um, what do we see? What would we expect to be true? So take a moment to read through these. Uh, so hopefully you answered this and took a moment uh, to think about the right answer is. So let's use process of elimination to figure out which one is our best answer. So covalent and ionic bonds. Um, in A, they, they, the answer is an atom can form covalent bonds with multiple partners or multiple partner atoms, but only a single ionic bond with a single partner atom, right? But we know that that's not true um, because we can have magnesium and we have, can have chloride and we can have chloride in an ionic bond, and so we know that ionic bonds can have multiple um, partner atoms. So that one's not true. Um, covalent bonds and ionic bonds occupy opposite ends of a continuous spectrum, right? So we have ionic on one side, and we have covalent on the other. Um, uh, from equal sharing of electrons, to completely unequal, right, with um, polar covalent somewhere in between. Um, that seems like a good answer, but we shouldn't commit to anything until we read the others. Um, so both involve electrical attractions between the electrons of one atom and the nucleus of another atom. Um, we know that uh, there definitely can be attractions between positively charged parts of an atom and negatively par charged part of an atom. Um, but we also know that in covalent bonds there are shared electrons, so that one doesn't seem like it's quite right. And lastly, we have ionic interactions remain when covalent bonds are broken in water. 
and that ionic bonds are much stronger than covalent bonds, which we know is a dead giveaway because covalent bonds are stronger than ionic bonds, and it turns out it's actually this is the other way around. Ionic interactions break in water, so if you put salt in water, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, it will dissolve, whereas covalent bonds um, may not dissolve. Okay, so we know that D is wrong. So the best answer here is B, um, which we already kind of thought was right, best was the best answer, um, but now we know for sure because the other ones are not that great. Okay, so I hope this has been useful. Um, let me know if you have questions. You can email me, um, or you can leave me comments, uh, or you can ask me in class, or any other way that uh, we can communicate. So, uh, time for me to sleep.